Congressman Cotter joins us this morning on Flashpoint. Congressman, thanks very much for your time. Oh, thank you, Devin. Well, let's start with, uh, you know, I, the book on you generally, Congressman, is that uh, you're usually the smartest guy in the room. And that means, though, that you're smart enough to know that you can't possibly win this thing. And when smart people make long shot runs at the presidency, they're either trying to position themselves for a run in the future or they're trying to position some issues that they want to see addressed in the campaign. Are either of those the case with you? No, I'm certainly not the smartest person in the room, Devin. I'm talking to you. <laughs> and, sec and, and secondly, look, as Haley Barber said today, the field is wide open from anyone, even someone in the back of the pack that can get traction and come forward as the Republican Party's nominee. I believe him. I think that his experience in the Republican Party shows that. And I, for one, have too much respect for the presidency and too much concern for what's happening to the American people to play politics with this. It's going to be a primary campaign. I'm under no illusions as to the ardor of the task before me. But I also believe that the opportunity and the necessity is there and the willingness of the American people, especially in the Republican primary, to listen to a new message. And the only way you can find out if they're receptive to it is to ask. Well, I don't want to spend the whole time of our conversation talking about the sub political substructure of these things, but you know, you, you've got about uh, half a million dollars on hand and some have been suggested uh, that, that that's going to be about a billion dollars short of what it would take to win this kind of thing and that uh, that even if you don't like candidates like Mitt Romney that they're far more financially positioned uh, to make the kind of expensive run that this is going to take. Well, we've seen already people come out of nowhere. We've seen people go back to nowhere. We've seen people with large war chests already falling behind in the polls. We see some of them sinking in the polls. And one of the beauties of democracy, as you know, Devin, is the fact that in the United States, we don't simply just take the richest person and nominate them to, for the presidency. We have a process which has been long established where people go into states, into caucuses, into primaries, put their message out. I would argue it's even easier today with the added advantage of social networking. And so the way that I view this is you take your message, you will get traction. If you make the mistake of thinking that your money will make you a message that will be appealing to the American people, well, we've not seen that happen yet, and I don't believe that it will. Social media, obviously, is a big part of uh, any uh, future run for the president, for anybody. You've got a lot, quite a few followers who follow you on, on, on Twitter. You're a clever guy, as I mentioned, and a smart guy, but sometimes maybe uh, too smart for your own good. Here's what your hometown newspaper had to say uh, as you made your announcement this past week. The Oakland Press and an editorial said the representative comes off as cold, arrogant, and egotistical. These are not qualities we'd like to see in a president. Your reflection on that's the, that's the take from your home, one of your hometown papers. Well, thank God for the First Amendment. And I've sworn an, oath to the, <laughs> sworn an oath to the Constitution to defend their right to say that, and I will honor that. Look, when you run for the presidency, this comes with the territory. Individuals have every right in the world to say whatever they want about you, and my job is not to be concerned about that. It's to get the message out to see what matters to the American people, not necessarily what individuals may think of me as a person. Well, your message will certainly be one of, uh, I, I think, to some people's uh, understanding, a, a, a truer cut from conservative cloth. You've taught uh, a balanced budget amendment. You've talked a lot about tackling uh, the deficit, and, but you've also talked about lowering taxes. And and some would suggest that that's really just political mumbo jumbo. There is no way to truly attack the deficit if you're talking about lowering taxes at the same time. Well, some people don't believe that economic growth actually raises revenue for the government because the increased tax base, as opposed to an increased tax rate, which ironically, as you know, reduces the amount of wealth that can come into the government. The reality is the real mumbo jumbo is people who think that raising taxes is going to somehow get us back to prosperity. That has not been the case. What it's going to do is we've seen from the jobs report and others where we've seen over 14 million people unemployed now. We saw a dismal 18,000 jobs created. We know 30 million people could be up looking for jobs that they can't find so they can move up the ladder of success. What we're seeing is a period of stagflation, stagnation on the verge of stagflation that's been brought on by big government and the bailout banks. And unless you're serious about fixing them, no economic plan is going to work because we have to restructure these banks, restructure the government so the credit can flow down to the entrepreneurs who will have the room to grow this economy to create jobs for workers and lay the foundations of what could be, and I believe will be, an unprecedented period of American prosperity. Probably a pretty popular position, I would think, for you in Michigan. You and I were at a, a dinner a couple of uh, weeks ago in Washington, and you and I uh, talked a little bit about the tale of two bailouts, the way that the automakers were treated in Neek seeking help from Washington versus the way that bankers were treated in seeking help from Washington. And I think you believe uh, that financially, uh, the bailout that was given to the banks without really requiring the kind of reform that we've seen in the auto world uh, leaves us worse off rather than uh, better off than we were before on financial footing. 
Well, it's absolutely the case. We're not seeing the credit come down. We've seen a contraction of credit for the first time since the Great Depression. There was no restructuring. There was no pain involved to try to get them fit for the 21st century or for an innovative entrepreneurial economy. Instead, they continue to sit there and try to capitalize without any way for the government to come in and help them restructure or to break them up and sell off their assets as people like James A. Baker or Luigi Zingales or even Simon, John Simon Johnson, former IMF chief economist. But with the auto industry, what America has to remember is that we have to produce, we have to manufacture, we have to farm, we cannot simply consume wealth. The American people understand this. And I would also argue, Devin, it's not only about our prosperity, it's about our security. I, for one, call me old-fashioned, have trouble with the People's Republic of Communist China being the leading manufacturer in the world with us continuing to lose our advantage in that area. Uh, we, well, we've, we've, of course, have helped create that because we chase low prices all around the world all the time. We also chase better returns on our own investments, uh, uh, maybe a, time, a, a different part of the conversation. But we just saw a horrendously low jobs uh, outlook report this past week uh, where we saw the nation only created uh, 18,000 new jobs in June. What, what, do you, what do you think we've got to do? To, what would you do to tackle unemployment? Well, first of all, Devin, I talked about restructuring the banks. I've talked about lowering the tax rates. We've talked about regulatory reform. But let me go back to a critical point. We're not just simply chasing low costs. If you look at comp competition amongst nations, as Adam Smith laid out, it was a comparative advantage of trade. If you made something better than I did or I made something better than you did, we would exchange them and the wealth would be generated between the two nations. Mm -hmm. When you talk about following the low cost to a place like communist China, where people are put in jail for passing out Bibles, or they still have prison camps for political prisoners, where they cyber spy on their people, where they they cheat us every single day in the, age, in the arena of international trade, I would simply point out that that is not what Adam Smith or anyone envisioned in terms of trade or a low-cost country. Because otherwise, then you're chasing the most brutal regime that you can possibly find that can bully its people into working for less than anywhere else on the face of the earth. That is not what the United States is about. It is certainly not inuring to the benefit of our prosperity or security here at home. But we've, we're watching wages go up right now in China to a point it's, it's unsustainable in many ways for them. Manufacturing is starting to leave China. It'll always go to a lower bidder, won't it? It is a question of fair competition amongst free peoples. That is what trade is about. What we're talking about and what we're seeing out of China right now is a mercantilist trade policy. As you remember, Devin, we were told that if they opened up the Chinese market, we would see vast prosperity for both the Chinese people and the people of the United States. But instead, what you're seeing is last year's $280 billion trade deficit, which tells you that we are not producing the goods here to sell there because they are an export-driven economy. They are curtailing their domestic market. They are putting barriers to U.S. investment and trade and trade opportunities there. This is not a reciprocal relationship and the unsustainable dichotomy between what was promised and what we're seeing in our trade deficits and value leaving the shores of the United States is certainly not inuring to our prosperity. I'd like to get to Iraq and Afghanistan before we have to wrap things up. Uh, it's been interesting uh, for some people who may feel that they, they've come into a time warp when all of a sudden you've got a lot of Republicans arguing uh, that we need to be pulling in our defense machine. You, however, believe that we need to stay in Afghanistan and Iraq until we've uh, created more stable environments there. The United States gave her word that we would help them achieve their liberty. Now, we cannot guarantee it, as we ourselves knew, and Ben Franklin told us, we will give you a republic if you can keep it. But the fragile gains that we've seen in Afghanistan and the successful gains and strides that we've seen in Iraq <clears throat> cannot be abandoned, cannot be precipitously withdrawn from, or we'll find ourselves worse off than we were when those were initiated. Now, we can debate why we're there. We cannot debate why we're in Afghanistan. Everyone understood that. But the reality is, Devin, is you do not want to put dollars and cents to America American security because what will happen is you'll be penny wise and pound foolish. Now in Afghanistan we know it's a long, hard, difficult battle. We know that there's trouble in terms of trying to work with the existing Karzai government. But the fact remains is the worst case scenario would be a revanchist Taliban killing the very people who stepped up for democracy that trusted the United States and watching the Taliban conjoin with Al Qaeda creating a new safe haven again in Afghanistan and then further working to destabilize Pakistan. And lastly, one quick question on social issues. Uh, a recent poll uh, that CNN conducted for the first time showed uh, ever that the a majority of those responding believe that uh, gay people should be allowed to get married. How do you feel about gay marriage? Well, like the president, I, I do not support same-sex marriage, but I also support federalism. I support the American people making their own determinations in their states, be it New York or be it was it like in Michigan. I do not want to see the federal judiciary, the federal government, or bureaucrats trying to enforce this, their view one way, uh, onto the American people. And that's what we're seeing, and I think it should remain at the state level.
congressman they've had a busy week